joining on our website or on our Calvary app. With that, I'd like to welcome my husband, Dave Love. Well, good evening. Glad that you could join us here this evening. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and we'll put a Bible in your hand. Oh, someone put this up here from, to remind me. So if you go uh, to our foyer there at the, at, the, at the desk, at the info desk, you will see this. On the back, you will have that. It tells you about everything this is all about. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what this is all about. On September 15th at Douglas County Fairgrounds, it's called the Born Wild Experience. It's on a Sunday afternoon. This is an evangelical opportunity where there is this cowboy that comes with this horse, not a brand new horse, but a horse that has never been ridden before, a horse that has never even had a blanket put on it before. This horse is not broken. And in this event, he is going to explain the gospel. He's going to explain your growth in the Lord Jesus Christ as he breaks this horse right in front of you. He usually gets bucked off five to six times, and he relates that of what it is to walk with God. And it's absolutely amazing. By the time he's done, this horse is broken and rideable. And so this is supposed to be just absolutely fantastic. I know of about 10 people that have gone to it and says, Dave, it's amazing. You have to go. I'm going to try my best to be able to be here, but be there. But here's the thing. It's free, but you still have to go online and get a ticket because only those with tickets will be able to go in there. I believe, I, I don't know how many it holds and, and, and how many seats or, or whatever, but I really encourage you to go to this and bring someone who doesn't know the Lord because I think it's really going to minister to them. And again, it's free, but I really encourage you to go. I just think that it's a blessed time and it's there at the Douglas County Fairgrounds on Sunday afternoon, not this next Sunday, but the following Sunday in two weeks. Amen? All right. So with that, let's go to Exodus. Chapter 21, which we will finish. As well as going deep into chapter 22. You know, we shall see. <laughs> but we are going to start with verse 22, because we didn't really jump into that. I said we we're going to hold off on that, but then we got into slavery part three last week. Um, and so we're going to start off here with verse 22 of Exodus 21, before we finish the rest of 21. And in verse 22, it says, if, a man, if men fight... Hurt a woman with child, so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows. He shall surely be punished accordingly as a woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So the husband could ask anything he wants, but it's the judges that are going to determine if it's right or not. Okay. Now, what we need to look at here is a couple of Hebrew words. Child. Hebrew word is hare. It means pregnant. And that's exactly how you should respond if you find out you're pregnant. Hooray! I just, perfect. It's a perfect word. The word birth in the Hebrew is yaled, and it means child offspring from the root yalad, which means to bring forth to be born. Literally, this means the child comes forth. This tells me that the fetus, the child that is in the womb, is a human being because it's called a child. It's called a child. And if any harm follows and the child dies, then that is why it's, you back up and, or further down it says a life for life. Okay? Life for life. Thus the child in the womb absolutely has the same value as a human being. We went over this and more in the teaching of the sixth commandment. Uh, part two, it was a pro-life message. I encourage you to get that. God's word makes it very clear that life begins at conception. And you know what? 
science also confirms that life begins at conception. And we went over that, that two-part series of, of the Sixth Commandment. The, re, the word prematurely is a very interesting word. It's yatsa. It means to go out, come out, go forth. So, if men fight and hurt a woman. So these men fought. The woman was hurt so that she gave birth prematurely. Okay. Now, the New American Standard Bible, I love that Bible, by the way, but they have mistranslated this. They have mistranslated this to say miscarriage instead of prematurely. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. Miscarriage always means death. Always means death. There's nothing here that tells us that the child died. Okay? Nothing at all. As a matter of fact, there's other words for that. There's a word for miscarriage. We see it in God's word. In Exodus 23, 25, and 26, it says, So you shall serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and your water. I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage. Or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. The word miscarriage here is the Hebrew word shakol. And it means to miscarry or to suffer abortion. We see it also in Hosea 9.14 and Job 21.10. So it's a different word. In Job 3.16 it says, Or why was I hidden like a stillborn child? Like infants who never saw light. The word stillborn there is nephel means untimely birth, miscarriage, or abortion. We see that word stillborn used in Ecclesiastes 6 as well as in Psalm 58, 8. So if God wanted to communicate here that this is a miscarriage or a stillborn, well, which indicates death, well, he could have used any of those words. He chooses not to. Premature, prematurely, yatsa is used 1,061 times in the Old Testament, and has never translated miscarriage in any other case. So why we would do that here? We shouldn't. We shouldn't. So there's no indication of death of a child here. The word miscarriage is a mistranslation. That is not the word here. The word is premature. And so if men fight, hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, there's no harm to the child. The child is fine. However, the woman... Is not. She was hurt. That's why she gave birth prematurely. And so she's going to get some sort of compensation. She should not have to go through premature labor. And because of that, she should get compensation. And it says, He shall surely be punished according to the woman's husband imposed on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. They'll figure it all out. They'll wonder why they were fighting to begin with, all this kind of stuff. But she got hurt in the process, had to give birth prematurely. Child is fine, but she was hurt. That's why she gave birth prematurely. And so the husband's, woman's husband could ask for certain compensation, and the judges will determine if that compensation is just or not. The judges make that determination. So let's continue here in chapter 21, starting in 12, okay? Um, and so we've gone over capital crimes. We've gone over personal injury now. Uh, and now we're going to go over criminal negligence. So here we're going to look at, we've already seen the capital crimes of personal injury. Now we're going to look at criminal negligence. There's consequences for negligence, whether it happens to someone who's free or a slave, whether it's accidental. Negligence here in verse 28 begins... As we see here, it says, if an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox will surely be stoned, its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. It was an accident. It was an accident. But guess what? That animal needs to put down. That animal needs to be put down. So that's the first case. It's accidental. The ox got loose somehow and, and gored and killed someone. Okay? It's not premeditated murder. All right, so because of that, they're acquitted. Um, they also lose, though, because a beast of burden is very, very expensive, and it hurts the owner as well, okay? But it was an accident. But if the ox tended to thrust with its horns in times past, that doesn't mean he's gored someone. It just means he has shown aggressive behavior. Maybe it's 
gored another animal, maybe, but it has shown that it is violent. It has shown that it is dangerous. And it was made known to the owner. The owner knows that that ox is dangerous. And he did not keep it confined. He didn't take the extra precautions to make sure it wasn't going to get out to do anybody any harm so that it has killed a man or a woman. The ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death. This shows right here how precious a person's life is. If an animal kills a human, God says that animals be held responsible must be killed. Must be killed. Now, in the first case, no prior indication. It was an accident. Okay. That's fine. The owner's not going to be held responsible. He had no idea. Okay. Second case, the owner was notified his animal was dangerous, and he took the risk instead of putting it down. He took the risk. Well, I'll just pen it up because it's valuable and everything. Okay. More valuable than another person's life? Well, I'll just make sure I keep. Okay. You can do that, but if it does that, you're going to die. You're going to die. Everybody's responsible for what they know. Everyone is responsible. And so instead of killing a dangerous animal for the safety of others, the owner still wanted to use this animal as a beast of burden. Guess what? You better keep a good eye on it. And you better keep it penned up. Because if not, it's going to cost you your life. If you feel for your animal more than the safety of others, shame on you. Shame on you. Your animal has harmed someone in the past. And you choose, because of your feelings, for that animal to keep that animal. And then it hurts someone else. You know who's responsible? You are. You are. Mankind is way more important than any animal. It is. And I'm sorry for those who are part of PETA. Animals are people too. No, they're not. And God makes that very clear. The life of someone is way more important. We've all known people, maybe it's happened to you, that whatever animal that you had attacked someone, a child perhaps, never done it before. Okay, I get that. You're, you're horrified by the whole thing. Okay, now what are you going to do about it? I can't put down this animal. It's, it's, it's my pet. Okay, because you care more how you feel about your animal than it possibly doing that to someone else again. Oh, it, it was just a one time. Oh, wow. It's a tough decision. I know that. I know that you feel for your animal. I, I understand that. I understand that you love your, that animal. But what you're saying is that you love that animal more than God's word. Which tells me you love that animal more than God. And it might never have been put to you like that. But remember that. And God is going to bless you for it. Because it shows you care more about God's word than you do about how you feel. And isn't that what the Christian walk is all about? Isn't that what maturity is all about? I'm going to obey God's word above and beyond how I feel. When you get to that place, man, you're walking with spiritual giants. You're walking with spiritual giants. And God makes it very clear that animal needs to be destroyed if it has been dangerous in the past. It needs to be destroyed. And if you are negligent, you pay with it with your own life. The law in society to show individuals cannot behave irresponsibly or carelessly. We are responsible for our actions, and we're also responsible for our inaction. If something is supposed to be done and we don't do it, we're responsible. And if something happens, we're negligent. Verse 30 says, If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life whatever is imposed of him. Here, what we see here is that if, um, if a family wants to show mercy by asking for res uh, restitution instead of retribution, then instead of demanding the death penalty, it could be that a sum of money is paid and the judges will determine that. 
And so this ransom was called blood money, a sum of money to redeem his life. Um, verse 31 says, whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. So again, first case, if it, if, uh, it doesn't matter if it's someone is 5 or 10 or 15, they're still worth the same value as an adult. And so if it gores him, then that, that ox has to be put to death. And if you've known about it before and you did nothing, and a young child is killed, then it's supposed to be life for life. But the family could say, okay, we're not looking for retribution, but we're looking for restitution. And the judges will determine what amount of money that is. And so, verse 32, if the ox gores a male or female servant, he shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be Stone. So again, first case, accidental. Same thing is going to happen there. There's actually two thoughts here. The thought is, is that in the first case, it's accidental. Yes, it's, it's, it's a, a, you know, we're all sad that the male and female servant has died. But it was accidental. So only the ox is killed. The other thought is, is that male or female servant, whether it's accidental or not, yes, the ox is killed, and yet you're still going to pay that master, 30 shekels of silver, because that was a worker for him that he's out now. That's a worker that's out for him. And the ox shall be stoned. So, didn't really run that down of how many different people, but it, it's kind of like it seemed to be six of one, half dozen another, of where, where they fall on that. Um, it's interesting to me because it's 30 shekels of silver, who else was sold out for 30 shekels of silver? Jesus. Wow. Price of a slave. Jesus was. Verse 33, it says, If a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. Don't be digging pits. What's the big deal? Why are you digging a pit to begin with? If one man's ox hurts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox, divide the money from it, and the dead ox they shall also divide. So whatever you can get from the dead ox and the live ox, you sell it and you split the difference. Okay? It was an accident, you know, but you still, you know, the other person shouldn't just have to be a victim. Oh, well. You know, and so sell off both and, and divide the money up. Or if it was known that the ox tended to thrust in times past and its owner had not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox. His has to die. And the dead animal shall be his own. Basically, this is all saying, you break it, you buy it. You know, and so you're responsible. Your negligence results in the death of your neighbor's animal. You're obligated to... Uh, give them recompense, and uh, to restore them. So these laws required the investigation, the analysis of judges, um, and so they're going to look into the account of intent and negligence. Um, and so all these laws are there to be able to say, do the right thing. Just do the right thing, okay? Now, here in Exodus 22, as we continue on, understand that law reflects who? The lawgiver. Okay, the lawgiver. It is God who's giving these laws. These laws speak of God's righteousness. It reveals God's character. And so as we read these um, little case studies, if you will, you're able to see the heart of God. And you see that God does demand justice. And we're going to see this justice seems to serve three purposes. Maintaining justice in the land granting compensation to the victims, teaching thieves that crime not only does not pay, it will force you to suffer loss. So, verse 1. If a man steals an ox or a sheep, slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for the ox, four sheep for a sheep. If the thief is found breaking in, and he is struck so that he dies. There shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. 
if the sun has risen on him, if it's light, if you could see him, and you can see he's just stealing stuff, and you strike him, well, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He shall make full restitution. If he has nothing, he shall be sold for his theft. And if the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox, donkey, or sheep, he shall restore double. Now, we went over this with the eighth commandment, you shall not steal, okay? And you can only steal if something belongs to someone else. If something belongs to some, someone else, then it's their property, which right there tells you the Bible makes it very clear. It's okay to own things. If you could not, if you could not own anything, then nothing can be stolen from you. But because it says do not steal, that means something can belong to you. You can own property. You can own things. And when you do, it's yours. And if someone takes it, that's theft. And God is very much against that. Now, God makes a difference between stolen animals that were killed or sold and stolen animals were still in your possession. Verse 1 and verse 4. Verse 1 says, if a man steals an ox or a sheep, slaughters it, sells it, and then he's caught. He shall restore five to one. Five ox for one, four to one if it's a sheep. But verse 4 says, if the theft is found alive in his hands, what he stole, whether ox, donkey, or sheep, then they give that one back that he stole, and then he has to give another one. They restore double. They restore two to one. Notice God, the lawgiver, is revealing something about himself here. God realizes that you have been victimized. He realizes that you have been a victim of theft, and because you've been a victim of theft, you should be compensated for it. You should be compensated for it. Not only should you just get your stuff back, but you should also get at least twofold. And the point of getting at least twofold is this. The victim gains and thus doesn't feel victimized. He profits, again, doesn't feel victimized. The thief learns not only will stealing not pay, but it will bring loss to him. He not only has to give it back, but now he has to work to be able to have another sheep or oxen to be able to pay it back. And they learn the value of property and hard work. We mentioned it a few weeks ago. It's kind of like the candy store principle that, that, uh, that happened when I was a kid, at least, is that if you stole something from a store, usually your parents would take you and march you back to the store owner. And not only would you have to give it back, but you spend the next two Saturdays working at his store. Not only do you apologize, but you work it off. So you realize that crime does not pay. And guess what? They now get your sweat equity for the next two Saturdays. Okay. I think that still should be a principle. Especially today if, you know, someone, you know, years ago when I used to teach them this, I, I can make the example, you know, if someone steals your stereo. Okay, dude, if you have a stereo now, <laughs> your, your car is 25 years or older. Okay. It's very difficult to, 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 you know, to steal that out of the car now. It comes with the car, and, you know, it, it just, you, you can't do that. So today, it's kind of like stealing a catalytic converter. One of the biggest things that theft is out there, wheels, rims, whatever it might be. Let's say it costs $1,000. You're caught. They give it back to you, your catalytic converter, your wheels and rims, whatever it is. It's worth $1,000. Guess what? They owe you another $1,000. That would be sweet. Be leave my car out in the worst area just to be sweet. Vandalism is theft. It's stealing the beauty from someone's property. Same reason. Whatever it costs to take that graffiti off, now you have to pay that owner whatever that cost was. Double of that. Those who are victimized wouldn't feel like a victim. They'd feel vindicated. That's exactly what God wanted you to feel, and at the same time, he wants the thief to learn a lesson and to change. That's God's heart. That's God's heart. Now, if someone who's stealing comes at night 
Like it says in verse 2, if a thief is found breaking in, he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. Why? Because it was at night. That's why. And guess what? You don't know the motive of the intruder at that point. You have an intruder in your house. You're there to protect your family. The best way to do that, take them out. But if the sun is up and you can see him, and he's way over there and he's trying to steal one of your sheep and get it out of one of its pens, okay, you don't need to go over there and kill him. You know that he's did it. Now you just have to report him to the proper authorities and, and things like that. And if you do kill him, then you're responsible for that. You're responsible for that. And then it goes on to say, going back to verse 1, verse 4, of just speaking of being a thief, um, it says, He should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft back into servitude, if that's what it takes in order for him to pay off what it is, that not only what he has stolen, but what he also has to give in the way of two, four, fold, uh, two to one or four to one or five to one or whatever the case may be. Verse 5, If a man causes a field... Or vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animal and feeds in another man's field. He shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If a fire breaks out and catches in thorns so the stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. It's the same thing today. You know, that's why you have barbed wire and all this other stuff around for fencing for grazing animals so it doesn't get into somebody else's property. Back then, they would have these stone walls, whether they break through the wall or jump over or whatever it is, you're responsible because that is somebody else's property. And if your animal does damage, well, you have to make restitution for that. You're trying to clear your field, and so you put fire to it, and you're trying to have a contained blaze and everything else, and it gets out of control, and whoops, it... You know, it goes into your, your neighbor's field. Yeah, you have to pay restitution. But it was an accident. We understand that. But you're still negligent. And you have to do what's right. You have to. Actions need to follow words. And so restitution needs to be put in order there. Verse 7, if a man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand to the neighbor's goods. So they didn't have ba banks back then, okay? They didn't have safes. They probably had an area where they hid certain things or whatever. But there's also bigger items that are worth a lot of money. And so you just make an arrangement with your neighbor. Hey, look, I'll look after your stuff if you have to go away on business or family reunion over here or whatever it is, you watch my stuff if I have to go away, and, and you have this relationship. You said, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do that. And while you're away, I'll stay there on your property, make sure nothing is stolen. You come back, something was stolen. So the judges get involved and say, was it a thief or was your neighbor the thief? You don't know. Well, the judges are going to make determination. And if they find out that what was stolen was that your neighbor didn't take it, an actual thief did, and he wasn't caught, oh well. That is the way it goes. The neighbors who are overseeing the property, guess what? They're not responsible for that. They tried to do their very best, and someone came and actually took the stuff. Verse 9, for any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, or clothing, or for any kind of lost thing which another claims to be his... The cause of both parties shall come before the judges. Whomever the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. There's going to be uh, very, very difficult things that kind of come the judge's way. Remember, the word judge here is Elohim. And it means, again, it means God's. And it means that you're supposed to have the righteous, okay, spirit of God. That you're truly going to seek out the truth. There's no partiality. You're going to do your very best. And you're going to judge righteously. You're going to judge righteously. Verse 10 says, If a man delivers his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or an animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away, no one seeing it, then an oath of the Lord shall be between them both, that he has not put his hand into his neighbor's goods. The owner of it shall accept that, and he shall not make it good. But if, in fact, it is stolen from him, 
he shall make restitution to the owner of it. If it is torn to pieces by a beast, then he shall bring it as evidence, and he shall not, and he shall not make good what was torn. So again, we have property that is stolen, could lead to resentment. If something was lost or stolen, you, you just have this idea it was him. He did it. Okay, but if there is no evidence, you have to let it go. You have to let it go. And so your neighbor is swearing before God and the elders and the, and the judges there, I didn't touch it. Okay? We believe you. If you're lying, then we're going to put you in the hands of God. And when you're put in the hands of God, nobody gets away with anything. That's still the way it is today, by the way. Nobody gets away with anything. Now, punishment might not come in the time frame that you would prefer it to come. But God watches. He knows everything. That person has stolen and killed for what he has and done so many horrible things. And he's getting away with it. How is he getting away with it? He's going to have to stand before God someday. And if he doesn't come to Jesus, because when you come to Jesus, you repent. And when you repent, you're like Zacharias, who does what? Everything that I've taken, okay, above and beyond, I will return what? Fourfold, he says. That's true repentance. They go and try and make amends of what it is that he did. If they don't do that, then it's probably not true repentance. But look at all... During their lifetime here, they never had to pay. Okay, where are they now? Burning in hell. That's not a good place to be. Nobody gets away with anything. Nobody does. Nobody ever will. Everything is made right on the other side when you're in heaven. All wrongs will be made right. And whatever you had to suffer through, guess what? Your reward is greater than anything you've ever suffered through. It's the glory of the man, the Bible says, to overlook a transgression. Wow. That person did this, this, and this to me. Lord, I'm giving them to you, praying and asking that they would come to know you. And it's going to be water off a duck's back. I'm not, not going after them for this. To your glory. And what you're going to receive on the other side of heaven because you went through that? Oh, my goodness. All wrongs will be righted. God is a God of justice. Verse 14, it says, If any man borrows anything from his neighbor and it becomes injured or dies, the owner of it not being with it, he shall surely make good. If its owner was with it, he shall not make a good. It was hired. It came for its hired. Hey, I'd like to use one of your oxen. Okay, well, I, I'm coming with it to make sure everything's okay. Great. How much would that be? Because I'm coming and I will do this in your field with, with my yoked oxen. It's going to be X amount of dollars. Great. The owner is out there doing that in the field. And all of a sudden the oxen breaks a leg or dies or whatever. Guess what? What you paid him to do, th th that's going to cover that. Okay? You shouldn't have to pay extra for that because... You weren't the one leading the ox. He was. He was the owner. Okay. Um, but if you're the one that asked for the animal and he put it in your care, it needs to come back in that same condition. Hmm. I wonder if that works today. It should. You borrowed something. It should come back in that same condition or better. And if not, we should pay to get it up to that condition. Verse 16 and 17. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed, not engaged to be married, and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of virgins. So, situation here is consensual sex. This is not rape. And so if a man seduces an, uh, a, a virgin to have sex with him, he was obligated to marry her, pay the regular dowry. If the father refused to give his daughter in marriage, the man still had to pay the bride price, the dowry to the father, since the possibility that the daughter would ever marry 
goes way down because she has lost her virginity. Now, in the case of rape, we have Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22.25 says, But if a man finds a betrothed young woman in the countryside, and what does it say? And the man forces her, lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. God says rape is wrong, and you should die. That still should be the way it is. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. There is a young woman, no sin deserving of death. For just as when a man rises against his neighbor and kills him, premeditated, even so in this manner. He's waiting in the countryside. Why in the countryside? Because there's no one there. For her to cry out and hear her. For he found her in the countryside, and the betrothed young woman cried out, but there was no one to save her, no one to hear. He forced her. She cries out, and there's no one to save her. They're out in the country. They're not in town. And so again, in the case of rape, the penalty was death. And if it was consensual, then he still had to pay a heavy price to the father, and he had to marry the girl. There's always going to be men and women who would like to have the pleasures of sex without the responsibility of marriage. God, however, tells us that sex should never be separated from the marriage commitment. That's where that belongs. In Israel, a man should not try and sleep around. If he seduces a girl, then, yes, he would then marry her if the father said yes. Now, I want to make something clear. Living together and having sex does not equal marriage. Well, we're married in God's eyes. No, you're not. Not even close. You cannot be married without a binding commitment covenant between God and man. And what includes that is the Father's blessing. The Father's blessing. In most cases, the Father would give his blessing in order to protect his daughter's reputation. But the Father also wanted what was best for his daughter. And if he thought the man was unsuitable for his daughter, then he had the right to refuse. This provided a very, very strong incentive for a man who wanted to get married to conduct himself in an honorable way. I asked my father-in-law for Mindy's hand in marriage. He made me sweat a little bit, but he did say yes. All three of my sons-in-laws asked for my blessing to marry my daughters. I remember one of them up in my office looking at him and saying, I'm very, very nervous. And I said, I just want to let you know, good. <laughs> He's the best. And my son asked his father-in-law for his wife's hand in marriage. It's the way it's supposed to be. Single men and women of the church, be honorable before God. Sex is for marriage. God's word calls us to be sexually pure. And we bear full responsibility in, to God in this area. Men are supposed to lead in the way of purity and chastity when they are courting someone. Dave already blew it. That's not the way that my wife and I met. And we came believers later on or we're in this situation now, whatever it is. You know what? First John 1 John 1.9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I love that verse. And even though you might not have had that history, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Father, we blew it. That's not how we did it. I'm so sorry. Please forgive us. You're forgiven. Thank you, Lord. It's awesome. It's awesome. I love it when I have a couple in my office who want to get married. And, uh, and the conversation kind of unfolds. And, and yeah, you know, and, and, and within the first five minutes after we pray with them, and this is great, you want to get married, they're going through premarital, and they start off. The very first thing we ask, okay, so we're just going to ask a couple things, okay? Are you living together? Yes. Then I'm going to assume you're sleeping together. Yes. Okay. That's great. You're here. What, what brought you here? Well, because we've been coming for a few months and, and we want to do the right thing. And we know the right thing is to be married in, in, in God's eyes. I said, that's great. That's awesome. This is fantastic. 
Now, do you want to do this because you really want to be right before God? I want to be right before God. You want this to be, um, uh, do, do you want this to be a witness to other people? Absolutely. We want this to be a witness to other person. Okay, I have something that's going to be awesome that is not only going to bring glory to God, but it's also going to be a witness to those around you. Are you ready? And they usually go, sure. <laughs> you know, I said, this is great. Your situation is awesome. Because it is the absolute foundation of bringing God glory and being a witness. One of you needs to move out. And it's going to be great. <laughs> Premarital is a few months. Probably be the minimum at least three months. Move out. Go, go back, live with your parents. Go live with a buddy, whatever it is. Let us know. And we will open up our homes here, and you can live there while we go through this because this is what's going to happen. As you're moving out, people are going to go, oh, is it not working out with your, with your girlfriend? No, it's working out great. We're about to get married. Then why are you moving out? Because we want to do things right in God's eyes. That's why. We've both become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we want to do the right thing. Thing. And so we're going to go through premarital. We're going to plan a wedding four or five months out, whatever it might be. And, 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 and we are going to stay celibate during that time. And guess what? God is going to bless because he's a God of new beginnings. It's awesome. According to what I, uh, I know at this point, every person that I have asked to move out and have, they're still married. There was a time years ago, 20 plus years ago, where I would say, you could do that or we're getting married next week. And they got married the next week. I did that like five different times. That one I do know, none of those five couples are together today. The Lord spoke, you know, to me and just said, you're not going to offer that anymore. I said, you're right. And I asked you to forgive me for offering that to begin with. Now, if, if, if there's those who say, well, we'll just get married next week. That's fine. I'm not going to do the wedding. I won't do that. You can go get married to the justice of the peace, however you want to do that. I'm not going to do that. Because I know that God's not going to bless that. Because I've seen it. When you do the difficult thing, God's in the difficult. And you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. And for you to move out and have the inconvenience of moving out and staying with someone that is a real bummer for the next three or four months or whatever, God is going to bless you for it. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be awesome. But if you try and take the easy way, that situation that, and it might not be that, but another difficult situation is going to come up, and you're probably going to mess that up as well. There are no shortcuts with God. He wants you to learn something here. He says, look, I know it's going to be difficult, but I'm in the difficult. Because <laughs> narrow is the, get, the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. You're already through the gate. Now it's going to be difficult. Yeah, I don't like difficult. Oh, then you're probably never going to see life. That's too bad, because God's in the life. He's in the life. Now, I want to go back a little bit. We were talking about slavery for the last three weeks. I'd mentioned before about a guy named William Wilberforce. We know about him. We know it's through him and, and, and not just him. There's other people involved as well. But in doing that, we're not going to jump into there's, a, there's a, this other guy. This really has nothing to do with anything we've just gone over. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just going to bring it to you straight, all right? But my wife had mentioned at the uh, retreat last week, oh, you got to listen to Dave's sermon. He's going to go over this guy and da-da-da. And I, and I go, I didn't do that. I didn't say I was going to do that. I, I was just saying, hey, I, I was looking this stuff up and this, that, and the other thing and how cool this is. So she thought I was going to have that in my sermon last week, and I did not. <laughs> okay, and so I'm going, okay, how do I weave it in here? It's, not, it's just clumsy. Boom, it's right here. So, <laughs> so... It wasn't just one person, okay, that abolished slavery. There's a lot of people that were involved with that. A lot of Anglicans. There's a lot of Quakers uh, there in, in Great Britain and, and things like that. So I'm going to show you a picture here of two guys. This guy right here is Granville Sharp. 
This guy here is William Wilberforce, okay? He's the guy that we know about, all right? But you're really going to know about him right now. He was uh, an Anglican that was also friends with Wilberforce, who was a Quaker, all right? And so they were the ones that were trying to convince him because you're an MP, you're a member of parliament. We need your voice in this. We have this huge movement going to abolish slavery, but we need the voice of someone in parliament. Wilberforce took that up. And Granville Sharp is one of the guys, okay, that was, was trying to get a hold of him, influence him, because he wasn't a member of parliament, but Wilberforce was. And you can't pass any legislation without somebody in parliament and then parliament voting for it, okay? So they needed someone in parliament, and Wilberforce was that guy. Now, this guy right here, Granville Sharp, he wasn't just someone who was against slavery. He was a godly man. Okay, his, his father was a minister, all right? And so he grew up, and he taught himself Greek and Hebrew, all right? And as he's studying the Greek and everything else, we come up with what is known as the Granville Sharp Rule, okay? Here it is. Memorize it. No. So I'm going to read it. You can go to gotquestions.org and read about that, all right? But this is what it says. It says, the Granville Sharp Rule states... When the copulative chi connects two nouns of the same case, nouns, either substantive, uh, adjective, or participles, or personal descriptions, respecting office, dignity, affinity, or connection, and attributes and properties or qualities, good or ill, the, the article, the definite article, ho, in the Greek, or if any of its cases precedes the first and, and the said nouns of participles and is not repeated before the second noun or, or participle, the later always relates to the same person that is expressed or described by the first noun or participle. Got that? Awesome. You guys are so smart. But for you dumb guys, which I'm one of them, here's a simpler version of that. Okay? It's in simpler terms. The Granville Sharp rule says that when two singular common nouns are used to describe a person, and those two nouns are joined by an additive conjunction, and the definite article precedes the first noun but not the second, then both nouns refer to the same person. Now, they say this principle of semantics holds true in all languages. We're not sure if that's absolutely true. I know it's true in the Greek. Okay? I do know that this is true in the Greek. Now, for those of you who still don't understand, I'm in your camp, still in your camp, all right? Let me break it down for you in the way of an example, and then you will understand. You will understand this with everything that was said. Here's the example. I met the owner and the chef of the French restaurant. Because of the definite articles before this descriptor of owner and this descriptor of the chef, it means it's speaking of two different people. Because of the definite the before each of those people. However, if I say I met the owner and chef of the French restaurant, that means it's speaking of the same person. Because there's only one definite article. Do you get that? Do you see that? Isn't that awesome? That first definition, you just want to go, you're killing me, Smalls. All right, just break it down to little baby words that I can understand so I know what's going on here. And that's what I've done for you right here, okay? Then the owner and chef are the same person because only one definite article, the, is used and is joined with the conjunction and without any other definite article. Dave, why are you bringing this to my attention? Because Bob and John brought to my attention over a year ago, okay, and I'm just going, this is awesome. I wonder when I'm ever going to use this. And, and, and I'm just kind of forcing it into the text, okay, because I just think it's so awesome. But the reason why I bring this up to you is because there are six places in the New Testament that speak of Jesus being God when this is applied. You want to see what those are? Good. We're going to go over here to Titus 2.13, okay, right here. The SBL GNT there, that's the version. That is the SBL edition of the Greek New Testament, okay? So this is the Greek text right here of this. 
So we're able to read in, Te- in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, in the English, it, it puts them two together. I, I, I could bring it there and say, look, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, are one and the same, so it shows that Jesus is God right there, all right? Well, in the Greek, it really says it, okay? And this is where you get to see it right here. They have it in, in the light blue. There you have it in the Greek. Does that help you? All right, great. Because what that says, there's the right there, okay? Ho. And then you have megalu, which is mega or great, the great God, and Kai. And then you have this right here, Savior. And this is the word R, okay? Our Savior. It doesn't matter if it's here or there. In the Greek, it, it would make you say it that way. So it says, Our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christos. So this is saying, looking at the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because it has the definite article here describing God and doesn't have the definite article before Savior, Jesus Christ, it's saying it's the same person. Saying it's the same person. Let's look at another one. Let's look at 2 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant, apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, I, I, I think our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is speaking of one person here. But here's the thing. There is, oh, look at that, a the. How come didn't put it there? How come in our new King James they didn't do it? I don't know, but it's there in the Greek. The theos, okay, our and, right here, soiter is is Savior, Jesus Christ. The God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The, the definite article is there in the Greek, but when they translate in the English, they didn't put it there. I like Granville Sharp Rule. Should be in there. Okay, you want to look at another one? 2 Timothy 1.12. Oh, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians. Yeah, one twelve. There's a Timothy reference. We'll get that in a second. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds like two people. Grace of our God and the, there's that, that definite article right there for Lord Jesus Christ. However, in the Greek, that's not the way it is. It starts with the God, okay, our, and, Kyrios, Lord, Jesus Christo, the God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, Lord Jesus Christ is God, because it has a definite article there. Picking up a trend? Greek is good. Let's go to the next one here. Ephesians 5, 5. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So it sounds like two different people are being spoken of here. But there's the the Christo and Theos, the Christ and God. Christ is God. Right there. We see it there. Let's go to the next one here. 1 Timothy 5.21. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's two people right there. No, it's not. Right here. The God Theos and Christos Jesus. The God and Christ Jesus. That's how it's written in the Greek. It's one person here. I charge you before God, the God, and Christ Jesus. The word Lord isn't even there. Granville Sharp Rule. Then we have this one. Pretty much saying the same thing. Another charge being given here. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
right there, the Theos and Christos Jesus, the God and Christ Jesus. God and Christ Jesus, same person. Granville Sharp rule. It's good to know a little Greek. That right there, you have six verses now that show you that Jesus is God. Now, there's other verses that don't have the Granville Sharp that we're able to show that. In Acts 20, you know, uh, 28, uh, you know, how, the, how God himself has purchased the church with his own blood. Well, how does he do that? How does God purchase the church unless the God is Jesus? Because who, who's one that gave his blood? Jesus did. So how does God purchase the, the, the church through his own blood? Unless Jesus is God, you know. So Granville Sharp not only helped abolish slavery, but he's able to show us in the Greek how this works every single time in the Greek. It always speaks of the same person. Now, we have other uh, areas of Granville Sharp all through the New Testament that show two people being that same person what he's talking about, but it's just not talking about Jesus and God, okay? So there's, there's way more in there, but because it works for that, it also works when it's speaking of God and Jesus and the thes before theos, or it's right there first, and then what's said next of that person is speaking of the same person, the Granville Sharp rule. Isn't that awesome? And it just fits perfectly here where we are. Because <laughs> we were talking about slavery, he had a lot to do with abolishing slavery, and that's the rule. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We are, your word makes it very clear that you very much care about justice and doing the right thing. And, and for we as believers to do what your word says above and beyond how we feel. And I'm thankful for guys like Granville Sharp and William Willie, uh, Wilberforce and all these people that were believers in you and it's because they knew the word of God they understood that slavery was wrong and so they cared more about being obedient to you than how they felt or what people felt about them and uh, but because they were faithful to you you were able to use them to finally abolish slavery and we were grateful for that and we're grateful for this man uh, Granville Sharp that also a godly man and that you were able to show him as he studied the Greek and knew the Greek of this grammatical uh, principle that you have in your word, and that Jesus and God, they're one, same person. We're going to take communion here tonight, and it just speaks of what an amazing God that you are and how you sent your son Jesus to die for the sin of mankind, and we are very, very grateful for that. And so, Father, if there's anyone here tonight that's been just struggling with things and you were just able to open their eyes and be able to see the wonders of your word. And, and they're able to be able to put this together and go, I do believe that Jesus is God. Yet they've never submitted themselves to you. I ask that they would pray this prayer because communion is only for believers, the family of God. That they would just pray this prayer right now. Father, I believe. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die for the sin of mankind, my sin. And so I ask you, forgive me of my sin, that you would come into my life and that you would change me because I believe that Jesus is God and he was perfect, sinless, and he took sin for me. I received that. I ask that you just now make me the godly child child of God, as you promise in your word. And I ask this by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, if anybody prayed that prayer, they would know they're being invited to the communion table where the bread represents your body, the juice represents the blood that was shed on the cross there at Calvary, there in Jerusalem. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you need gluten-free, raise your hand really, really high. John will bring that to you. And hold on to the bread and juice, and we'll take that together. Come down, found of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy 
never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon Father, thank you so much for this bread that we have in our hands as it represents your son, Jesus Christ, and how you were the great pursuer of us. We didn't pursue you. You pursued us, and you sent your son, Jesus, to die for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us on the cross. You demonstrated your love that way. You didn't wait until we were crying out to you. You came after us, and Lord, we are so grateful for that. Let's partake. Father, the juice that represents the blood, that precious, precious blood. It's not silver, it's not gold. But it's the precious blood of Jesus. And he voluntarily went to the cross. They took on this horrible, horrible torture and death. Took upon your wrath. Spilt his blood upon the ground. So we wouldn't have to. And so we were very grateful for that may be seen by how we want to be a light to others. Let's partake. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. Yes, let's all stand. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The, the Lord, Lord make his face to shine upon thee. 
and be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance, his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. And please don't rush off if you feel like you want prayer. As always, we are inviting you to come down uh, to the uh, platform here to the altar and just pray with us. If you have needs, we would love to spend some time with you guys. God bless you. Have a great evening.